Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at another Mike Riddle video, this time on how fossil evidence supposedly does not support the idea of human evolution. So let's go! Welcome to Bible Answers for today, where we talk about God's creation and how to defend our faith. I mean, if you think about it, if your God is the one true God and really wants us to believe in him, your faith wouldn't need defending. It would be the only one in existence. We're in a four-part series called Mankind, God's Greatest Creation. Yeah, because a bunch of hairless apes that are destroying their only planet are a much better creation than the entire rest of the universe. This is why atheists laugh when Christians accuse them of being arrogant. No atheist that I know would ever make a claim that even comes close to the arrogance of the idea that the existence of humanity is the best thing that ever has or ever will happen in the entire universe. And in this final session, we're going to talk about the fossil record. Does it support or prove humans evolved by naturalistic processes? Spoiler alert, even if not a single one of the fossils of our ancestral lineage were ever found, there is still enough evidence for evolution in things like homology, DNA, phylogeny, other evolutionary paths that we have found in the fossil record, and more. We have no reason to believe that the rest of life works in a way that doesn't apply to our species and our species alone for unknown reasons. And our challenge question for this series has been, did humans really evolve over millions of years by naturalistic processes, or were we created by an all-knowing, all-powerful Creator God? And the correct answer is the evolved over millions of years one. Keep in mind, though, that the two parts of your question are not mutually exclusive. Creationists like to be very divisive like that. If you don't believe in a literal Genesis creation 6,000 years ago, you obviously are an atheist, which ignores the vast majority of Christians who do accept evolution and either believe that God started it or God guided it. So for most Christians in the world, the answer to your question is, why not both? Both. 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 Both is good. The common perception is that the fossil evidence supports humans evolved from ape-like creatures. Yes, that is the common perception, and it does. Though that image of human evolution is highly flawed. It's more like this. Notice how in this tree it doesn't actually have Homo sapiens as being the direct descendant of any of the other apes in the tree. That's because we can't be 100% certain that we were actually descended from any of these organisms without a DNA analysis. So when we find something that looks like it belongs in our lineage, the safe assumption is that it was a cousin of our direct ancestor rather than it being the direct ancestor itself. Though it is entirely plausible that any of the extinct great ape species that we have found are in our direct ancestry. But if they weren't our direct ancestors, they would have been close enough relatives to our our actual direct ancestors that a study of their morphology will still demonstrate how we evolved. The idea has been promoted with charts and textbooks depicting human evolution. Yep, it sure has. Let's just take a look at the facts. Piltdown Man, discovered in 1912 in Piltdown, England. Let's just discuss the facts, he says, before bringing up a known hoax. What, is your argument going to be that those dumb evolutionists were tricked by this hoax for a while, therefore all of evolution must be false? Let's see. What was found? Fragments of a human-like skull, jawbone fragments similar to apes, and several teeth. Yep, that sure is what they claim to have found. It was claimed to be 500,000 years old. The New York Times ran an article then, Darwin Theory is Proved True thereby demonstrating that the crap science journalism that we see today has a history to it. Piltdown Man was never what any scientist would have pointed to to demonstrate that evolution is true. Even in 1912, there was better evidence than that. I mean, Darwin predicted the existence of a moth with a proboscis of 30 centimeters based on his observation of an orchid in 1862. They found it in 1903. When the first Archaeopteryx was discovered, its head was not well preserved. Based on a later discovery of two seabirds with teeth and their locations in the fossil record, it was predicted that Archaeopteryx would also have teeth. Several years later, in 1877, they found another Archaeopteryx fossil, this one with a well-preserved skull. Guess what it had? Teeth. Granted, human evolution tends to be more interesting to us humans, so that will make the headlines more often, but my main point here is that whoever wrote that Times article was just going for the 1912 equivalent of clickbait. The scientific community celebrated the discovery as the long-awaited missing link between ape and man. 
So there wasn't much of a fossil history of our ancestors when Piltdown Man was discovered, and this turns out to be rather important later on in the story. The only hominid fossils that we were aware of at the time were Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis, and Neanderthals were thought to have been humans suffering from some kind of deformity at the time. So the evolutionary history of the human skull didn't have very much in the way of fossil evidence at the time that Piltdown Man was discovered, or rather forged, and scientists of the time thought that a larger brain came before the omnivorous diet. So the person who forged it made it fit that preconceived idea, and as a result, it was somewhat accepted by the scientific community of the time, though it is important to mention that the validity of the find was challenged as early as 1913. For over 40 years, Piltdown models were displayed around the world and taught in schools as proof of human evolution. Yeah, it was, but not quite to the degree that you're implying. I mean, even now when we have much better evidence for human evolution, how many pictures of Australopithecine do we show in high school biology textbooks? Like, maybe three? Perhaps a few more? It's not like the entirety of evolutionary theory depends on these models and pictures. Take them all away, and it's still true. And yes, the textbooks of the time were wrong, which is why science textbooks are generally updated regularly so that as new discoveries are made, they can be incorporated. This includes the correction of errors. I guarantee you that a century from now they'll be able to look back at our science textbooks from today and laugh at all the inaccuracies, but that's exactly how scientific progress works. You slowly weed out the incorrect ideas as we learn more about how the world works and come up with more accurate ideas. Well, let's look at the rest of the story. In 1953, the newspapers reported the real story. Piltdown Man was a hoax. The teeth had been filed down to make them appear human-like. The bones had been chemically stained to make them look old. The Piltdown forgery had fooled many of the best scientific minds. Yep, you sure are correct there. But as I pointed out, Piltdown Man was not universally accepted. It was actually quite controversial, with it being challenged in 1913 by David Watterson, in 1915 by Marcelin Boulle, again in 1915 by G.S. Miller, and in 1923 by Franz Weidenreich. Most of these challenges agreed that the find was of a non-human ape mandible and a human skull, with some actually specifying that it was an orangutan jaw, which it was. Other challenges had the skull reconstructed differently than the one Dawson had done, which was part of G.S. Miller's challenge to it, as it seemed quite convenient that the skull had been broken in just such a way to leave the reconstruction almost completely open to individual interpretation. How could this happen? It's through wishful thinking and a strong commitment to evolution. It's more like it just confirmed the beliefs that these European scientists held that humanity evolved in Europe first. It's also interesting how the most vocal critics of Piltdown Man were not British, and most British scientists were actually accepting of it, because they wanted to have a significant paleontological find in the UK. But here it becomes important to point out the part of the story that you, rather tellingly, don't even touch on. How did we find out that Piltdown Man was a hoax? Well, as we discovered more and more hominid fossils, Piltdown Man was increasingly the odd one out. The more we learned about how we actually evolved, the more it looked like Piltdown Man didn't fit the picture. So they examined the bones more closely in the 1950s and found them to be completely fraudulent. Importantly, the exposure of Piltdown Man as a fraud actually cleared up the proper evolutionary development of the hominids, as the acceptance of Piltdown Man as genuine had completely muddied the waters. But yeah, you kind of have to skip that bit, because as it turns out, it was evolutionary science that was responsible for exposing Piltdown Man. Remember when you said, let's look at the rest of the story? Maybe you shouldn't have worded it in a way that implied you would actually tell the whole thing. It should have been more along the lines of, let's look at the end of the story and skip the middle, which contains important details about how we arrived at the end. Zenjanthropus, discovered in 1959. What was found? Portions of a skull, jawbones, and some teeth. It was claimed to be 1.75 million years old. An article in the National Geographic claimed it to be the earliest man yet found and obviously human. I've read that article. It was authored by Louis Leakey, husband of Mary Leakey, who found the skull. It's a very speculative piece filled with flowery language, and was written before any detailed analysis of the find was completed. It makes a few mistakes, the biggest of which was claiming the skull was around 600,000 years old, which later dated and corrected to 1.75 million years. He also describes his definition of what makes for a human being, and once you get rid of all the flowery language he uses, it appears to be the use of tools. 
And I'd like to point out that the first sentence of the article where you got the obviously human line from was talking about the teeth, which the image description from the article points out are twice as wide as modern humans. So from these clues, we can figure out what he meant by obviously human, and that meaning appears to be much more general than a reference to our specific species. And if we look at the human evolutionary chart that I had up earlier, we can see that Paranthropus, which is the genus that includes Zingenthropus, which is more properly known as Paranthropus boisei, is the last step before the genus Homo. Homo is the genus which, if you belong to it, you are scientifically considered a human being. So he wasn't far off. The rest of the story. In 1961, two years after the discovery, Zingantropus was downgraded. It was just another ape-like creature. It was never officially recognized as being one of the human species. That was the speculation from the guy whose wife discovered it. Remember where you pulled those quotes from? National Geographic. National Geographic is an excellent publication, but it is not a peer-reviewed science journal, and as such, it is more susceptible to allowing things like speculation to make its way into its pages. It wasn't downgraded two years later, it took two years to analyze it, and the analysis concluded that it was 1.75 million years old, and that it was a member of a group of hominids dubbed the robust Australopithecine, now known as Paranthropus. But anyhow, your whole argument here seems to be that the initial conclusions which were arrived at without rigorous examination turned out to be slightly off, and were later corrected once analysis was completed, therefore all of human evolution is false. That just doesn't add up. Rambopithecus, discovered in 1932. It was claimed to be over 12 million years old. Why do you... Ins never mind, I know why you insist on doing this, but Ramapithecus was a name given to a fossil that was thought to be separate genus from Sivapithecus. They were later reclassified as a species of the genus Sivapithecus. There is no Ramapithecus. But yeah, you have to make it sound as if we keep changing things to make them fit our evolutionary worldview or whatever. Heaven forbid you provide up-to-date accurate information on any of these things you're discussing. Well, I mean, the time frame on Sivapithecus is from 12.5 to 8.5 million years ago, so you got that detail close enough for me, but come on. What was found? A few teeth and some fragments of a jawbone. Is that all they found? Well, color me shocked and convert me to creationism. If that's all they found, they can't possibly have drawn any correct conclusions, which automatically invalidates all other fossil finds ever, including the later find of a more complete jaw, which is what ended up causing all the fossils dubbed Ramapithecus to be reclassified into the Sivapithecus genus. Time magazine in 1977 ran an article, Ramapithecus is ideally structured to be an ancestor of hominids. If it isn't, we don't have anything else that is. Yes, the initial impression of Ramapithecus was that it could have been the common ancestor of the entire hominid group. That turned out not to be the case, and we still don't have a fossil from something that would fit there. But this turns out to be just like that clip from Futurama, where they go through all the transitional forms we have, but it's never enough for that creationist orangutan. You go back far enough, and yes, one transition is missing. But that does not invalidate everything that we do have. So yeah, we still don't know exactly what the common ancestor of the entire hominid group was, but that doesn't mean that magic is now on the table. Well, the rest of the story. A baboon living in Ethiopia was found with a very similar jaw and tooth structure. As a result, Ramapithecus was dropped from the human evolution line. It was just another ape. Where did you get that from? That is not even close to what happened. It was reclassified to be an ancestor of orangutans based on a complete jaw that was found in 1976, and by the discovery of parts of the facial skeleton, and by molecular studies. As far as I can tell, baboons had nothing to do with it. The way you phrase that makes it sound like we found one specific baboon whose jaw was different from the other baboons, I guess? And that baboon's jaw was similar to the Ramapithecus jaw, therefore they reclassified Ramapithecus based entirely on one baboon's apparently abnormal jaw? That doesn't make any sense. Baboons don't even come into it anywhere. Going with the Linnaean taxonomic system, baboons aren't even in the same family as orangutans or Sivapithecus. Ergo, Sivapithecus are definitely not an ancestor to baboons. Once again, a case of imagination and false information. Who's the one with imagination and false information? The guy who brings a baboon to an orangutan fight, or the people who issue corrections when further study shows their initial impressions to be in error? Lucy, one of the famous Australopithecines, was found in Ethiopia in 1974, considered to be one of the first in line to be human. Considered by who? The first in line to be human would have been the last universal common ancestor, because by definition that organism was the first in line to be any of the species we have today. 
Unless you mean the first of the great apes to be considered a human species, but that title goes to Homo habilis, which is of course subject to change pending any future discoveries, but at the moment Homo habilis is the oldest known human species. I don't know, man, I'm tired of trying to guess at what you're talking about, can't you just be clear and concise for once? Less than 40% of the fossil was found. It was claimed to be 3.2 million years old and claimed she could walk upright. Yep, and 40% of a fossil was adequate for reconstruction. If you have 40% of the bones of an animal, you can get a pretty good idea of what that animal would have looked like, especially in a symmetrical animal. Case in point, how would you even know that you only had 40% if you couldn't figure out what 100% looks like? So either 40% is enough to know what they look like, or we don't have enough to come to the conclusion that we only have 40%. Well, the rest of the story. Lucy stood three feet six inches tall, the same size as a chimpanzee. Since they are of similar size, they are obviously the same species. That's how we know that chimps and bonobos are the same species. Way, that doesn't quite check out. The skulls of Australopithecines are very ape-like. Yeah, accurate. They were very ape-like, since they were apes. Do you know what other species has ape-like skulls? Modern Homo sapiens. We are apes. But yeah, Australopithecine skulls were closer to the Artipithecus skulls than to the Homo skulls. That's exactly the way it should be, considering that on the evolutionary tree, they are much closer to Artipithecus than Homo. Not every fossil we find in our lineage needs to be strikingly human. In fact, if we couldn't find any skulls that ride the boundaries between the more human and less human great apes, that would be a problem for evolution. Because Australopithecine were obviously not human, but had started to develop certain human-like traits such as upright walking, that fits right in with what we would expect from the apes that lived at that time and were in our lineage. The brain size is estimated to be one-third the size of humans. Their brain was about 380 to 430 cubic centimeters. Humans have brain sizes ranging from 975 cc's up to almost 1500 cc's, so it's actually a range of being 25 to 45 percent the size of human brains. I'll file this one under close enough. Lucy's pelvic bone was identical to a chimpanzee, meaning it did not walk upright. Whoa, 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 hold on there, Sparky. They are not even close to being identical. Here they are, side by side. You don't even need to specialize in hominid morphology to be able to tell them apart. And just for shits and giggles, here's a human pelvis. Seems like two of them are in a different category than the other one. One of these things is not like the others. Which one is different? Do you know? Can you tell which thing is not like the others? I'll tell you if it is so. Now at this point, he just rapid fires a bunch of characteristics that he claims makes Lucy more ape than human. He's completely wrong on a number of them, but even if I grant each and every one, it makes sense that they would be closer to the other great apes than to humans, because in the evolutionary tree, they are closer to the other great apes than to humans. But there are undeniable characteristics that Lucy has that makes her placement in our lineage a fairly certain thing including, but not limited to, the pelvis being angled in such a way as to make upright walking easier. But I'm skipping the rest because, quite frankly, this discussion is getting rather dull. Neanderthals, first discovered in 1856. I'm going to let him go for a bit, but sped up to get through this section. It's rather amusing to me, but if I go point by point on everything he says, we'll be here for all of eternity. The original drawings were very ape-like, making it look pre-human. The rest of the story. They made jewelry. They used musical instruments. They buried their dead, much like modern funerals. They were capable of speech. Their brain capacity was slightly larger than the average human today. They made advanced tools. They had certain physical characteristics, like a thick brow ridge and wide nasal cavity. However, nothing in their anatomy differs from human abilities today, and even their DNA is within the human range. Neanderthals are another example of artistic imagination and an uncritical commitment to evolution rather than good science. All these discoveries have shown that Neanderthals were fully human, descendants ultimately from Adam and Eve. <laughs> did you see what he did there? He went through the data on Neanderthal very quickly and pointed out why they should be considered human. And they were human. They were a different human species. How do we know they were different? Well, as Mike here himself pointed out, they had different skull structures, they had different DNA, they had different physical characteristics. He pointed out himself how very different they are from us, yet also how similar. Almost as if they were our close cousins on the evolutionary tree. Well, we bred with them after all, so would that make them kissing cousins? Next up is Homo erectus, and Mike does it again, so let's watch that on Fast Forward as well. Homo erectus, meaning upright man or upright ape man, they're claimed to have lived between 1.9 million years ago and 143,000 years ago. Well, the rest of the story. They're identical to Neanderthals, except smaller in size. From the neck down, they resemble an Olympic power athlete of today. The scientific analysis has shown they are completely human. Homo erectus is just another case of evolution imagination. You are 
painfully close to self-awareness here. You are actually doing an okay job of explaining exactly how we know that Homo erectus were indeed human, that is part of the Homo genus, yet a different species from us and Neanderthals. Of course, there are more differences between them and the Neanderthals than just size, but come on, you are doing a decent job of describing a slow gradient between species leading from the rest of the apes to modern humans, and the irony is completely lost on you. Ida, a more recent discovery, discovered in 1983, 95% intact, dated to be about 47 million years old. The newspaper headlines, Fossil Ida, Extraordinary Find is Missing Link in Human Evolution. The rest of the story. 100 days after that great announcement about Ida, it was revealed to be another blunder. Ida was identical to a modern lemur. 100 days after the discovery of Ida, we only had a small fraction of the skeleton. It was an amateur excavation in which the skeleton was divided on two stone slabs. So even if that was the conclusion drawn at the time, the two slabs weren't reunited until 2007. And in this 2009 paper, they wrote in their conclusion that, of particular importance to phylogenetic studies, the absence of a toilet claw and tooth comb demonstrates that Darwinius massillae is not simply a fossil lemur, but part of a larger group of primates, Adipoidea, representative of the early haplorine diversification. So no, it's not a lemur. In 2007, a new discovery was made in Morocco. The New York Times just recently ran an article, June 2017, Oldest Fossil of Homo Sapiens Found in Morocco, Altering History of Our Species. It's claimed to be 300,000 years old. Well, let's do a little critical thinking about what was claimed. How many times will they have to alter or rewrite human history? And how can we ever know to teach the correct history if it keeps changing? Wait, so your problem there is that some conclusions were changed to better fit the data in the past, therefore this one must also be wrong? I mean, we could just cling to our pre-drawn conclusions despite all evidence to the contrary, but that wouldn't make for very much, if any, scientific progress. Yes, we are likely teaching things today that will turn out to be wrong eventually, but they will not be found to be wrong by people like you who just shout out, but they've been wrong before, so how do we know they're right now? It will be by people who see something that is generally thought to be correct, take a closer look, and then presenting a slightly better hypothesis. The vast majority of scientific progress is done this way. One hypothesis is presented. It is plausible. Let's try and find out what's wrong with it. If something is found to be wrong, we need a better hypothesis. If we haven't found anything wrong, try again from a different angle. Repeat. If you actually find something wrong with the entire theory of evolution, you need to have an extremely robust replacement theory. And I know you won't like hearing this, but magic is not a robust replacement theory. Words like suggest, researchers believed, estimated, must have been, occurred throughout the article. Yes, that's called hedging, because every scientist knows that there is a chance that they are wrong, and there could be another more accurate interpretation of the data that they haven't thought of yet. They don't generally have the hubris needed to speak in absolute certain terms. Indicating a lot of assumptions and not real facts. No, it indicates a willingness to change their minds if a better hypothesis is presented. The article states their brains differed in fundamental ways. How did they know this? No brains were found. No, no brains were found. But you know what was found? The things that hold the brain. Do you know what we can tell from a skull? The shape and size of a brain. The brains were the same size as ours, but the shape was not our distinctive round shape, but the long and low shape shared by earlier hominins. That's the fundamental difference they were talking about. Their faces were essentially the same as ours too, with a few minor differences. Also, once again, you're not looking at peer-reviewed journals, but a news report. No future scientist will ever cite this New York Times article when doing further research into ancient Homo sapiens. It looks like another case of mistaken identity. How exactly? Are you saying that they're not human? They're a different kind of ape? If that were the case, then that's an even better example of our lineage than any of the ones you put firmly in the ape category. If they are human, how does their different brain shape and slightly different facial structure fit into your worldview? If they're not human, how does the fact that they're so very similar to us fit into your worldview? It seems like there's some explaining to do on your part. You can't just hand wave it away as a mistaken identity. Conclusion. The track record is... An initial claim of a new fossil find that proves evolution, and later the fossil is downgraded or dismissed. Nope, not even close. Sometimes, initial efforts in categorizing a fossil are not entirely accurate, so as we collect more data, we recategorize them as needed. It's really not that hard a concept to understand. In every case, the fossil evidence that has been used to prove evolution and discredit the Bible 
has been proven to be false. Firstly, that's not even close to true. Secondly, even if you were right about absolutely everything you said in this video, you yourself gave good evidence for evolution even if you didn't realize it at the time. We can always go back to the original facts found in the Bible. And let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that was before he created woman or the other animals. Meanwhile, in Genesis 1, God created man in his own image, male and female he created them after he created all the animals. Not really relevant to the overall point of the video, granted, but it's always fun to bring up biblical contradictions. And then we go to Psalm 100, verse 3, for more facts. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Is that a fact, or is it really more of a metaphor? Because last time I checked, human being did not equal sheep. Though certain populations of humans are said to be somewhat attracted to sheep. Is this verse a justification for that? Makes you think. Anyway, that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Liam Paiva Acosta, who says, There's one thing I always point out to people just to make sure they understand what they're saying. If you support the idea that all adults should be able to marry all other adults, then you're saying that you are okay with incestuous marriages. I don't think I've ever said that all adults should be able to marry all other adults. It's more along the lines of any consenting adults, but of course there is the stipulation that their union not harm anyone. An incestuous marriage potentially harms any children that might be had. And that's saying nothing to the difficulty of obtaining consent in a relationship that already has a complicated power dynamic. In families, there is usually some form of authority that certain members have over certain other members. Parents have authority over children, older children are often given authority over the younger children by the parents, and even if they aren't, they often and act as though they have authority over them. Same with uncles, cousins, and the like. The point is, there is much more in the way of complicating factors when it comes to incest than just whether or not they are adults, and there is a potential for harm in any heterosexual incestuous relationship. I know you're really just trying to get a yuck response out of me and make a connection between that yuck response and homosexuality, but there are rational ways of thinking about stuff like this. And yes, I will admit that my gut reaction when thinking of incest is most definitely yuck. But that was probably programmed in by evolution, as non-incestuous relationships produce healthier offspring, so those who felt a yuck response to the idea of being intimate with a member of their own family had a survival advantage. So don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Facebook and support me on Patreon. See you next time.